thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, be here to share this information with you. Um, nice to see Professor Peretti again. This is the second time that we've uh, lectured together, so um, he obviously enjoys coming to Australia. Welcome. And uh, we discussed uh, what he'll be doing for the next two days, which is uh, sampling Adelaide wine. Um, so I was asked to uh, present on um, NBI in the context of oral cancer, um, oral potentially malignant lesions, that's the proper terminology, um, and ethical margins for oral cancer resection. And hopefully you'll see uh, in the presentation that we are really talking about ethical margins. And you might think, really, what is all that about? So let's get cracking. These are uh, the uh, conflicts that I have to declare. I work very closely with Olympus uh, locally in Australia. We have a, an educational and uh, research collaborative uh, grant together. Uh, they support my research into MBI and uh, that of other units associated uh, uh, w with my uh, group. Uh, and I have a consultancy uh, with Olympus. However, all that being said, they never vet my uh, presentations, they have no influence on my research and sometimes I'm not sure if they like what I have to say but hopefully uh, today they will. So thank you very much for their support in uh, supporting our research and I'll highlight a whole heap of that here uh, today. Uh, so you had an excellent um, uh, introduction about narrowband imaging, uh, how it works, what it is, so I'm just going to um, go through these concepts again uh, very, very briefly, uh, just to remind you and then to focus your attention on the questions that we'll be um, answering today and I'll uh, pose a whole heap of questions for you. Um, my area of interest is uh, oral cancer and precancerous uh, lesions of the oral cavity. That's what I'll focus my conversation on today. Um, I do work with a whole uh, group of head and neck surgeons and we've got a whole heap of other NBI related uh, oncological research in head and neck um, that I'll present to you today, but I am not a head and neck surgeon, so um, I'll just state that categorically. Indeed, I'm not even an oral surgeon or a maxillofacial surgeon, and you might think, my goodness, why do you dabble in NBI? And I'll show you why we dabble in NBI, because it extends beyond just cutting things out. So um, NBI, this fantastic simple idea of two parallel beams of light at uh, blue 400, uh, 400 to 430 and green 525 to 555 nanometers run in parallel, uh, which uh, highlight to us not only vasculature, and I know that people concentrate on vasculature, but if you really pay attention to what you can do with uh, narrowband, and that was highlighted in Professor Peretti's uh, earlier talk, you can see significant surface changes with narrowband. So yes, the original concept was all about vasculature and angiogenesis in the context of um, uh, cancers and the, um, I guess, uh, biological reason as to why this technology works, uh, but it can do a whole heap more and I'll highlight that to you. So it is an optical enhancement technology. It's uh, designed to help us see things better. <clears throat> so um, we've seen this uh, uh, Olympus uh, diagram previously, the uh, blue light at superficial um, uh, penetration and then the green light at a little bit more deeper penetration, highlighting different uh, parts of the vasculature and of course the way that those images are then uh, um, uh, shown in the context of reflection in uh, our eye uh, is basically uh, centred around these so-called brown dots that everyone talks about um, and it's very simple to talk about the brown dots uh, but I think uh, understanding why we see the brown dots is very important if uh, we're to um, uh, explain and convert people to um, uh, wanting to use uh, narrowband. But of course simply put, um, look for the brown dots and all will be well. Um, so hopefully we'll explain some of the um, underlying uh, biology and um, 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 cellular and molecular features as we go. So um, we've uh, also been introduced to this concept of peak absorption of hemoglobin and of course uh, with blood vessels comes blood and blood cells 
and of course uh, the component of hemoglobin and that's why we have significant absorption of these two peak uh, uh, wavelengths uh, and that's uh, um, part of uh, the uh, application of narrowband in the context of uh, mucosal uh, pathology. So important just to remember that that longer wavelength, that green at about uh, 550 odd, uh, penetrates a little bit deeper so you get to see the underlying uh, blood vessels in the context of veins and the blue which is a shorter wavelength although the peak is higher, um, uh, absorbed a little bit more superficially. So assuming that um, everyone has uh, paid attention to the first two speakers and um, um, un understood uh, how the technology works, uh, this is the setup that I have in, in my clinic um, and uh, essentially the same setup that we have in the hospital at uh, Charles Gardner Hospital in Perth uh, where we work with the head and neck surgeons uh, doing the uh, initial consultation similar to Professor Peretti, but then uh, also present in, in theatre, and uh, I'll discuss that in a little while. <clears throat> so these are all the questions that we're going to have to answer today. So that's why this presentation will go for about an hour, so you need to really stay awake. Um, can NBI help detect a lesion? Of course, I'm always talking about in the context of um, oral cavity lesions, but I will show you some uh, non-oral cavity uh, pathology. Uh, is NBI better than fluorescence? Can NBI outline the extent of a lesion? Can NBI detect oral potentially malignant lesions? Something that I spend a whole heap of my time looking at as an oral medicine specialist and I um, uh, do a lot of work on that. Can NBI aid detection of epithelial dysplasia? Um, that's, a, that's a tough one. Um, is NBI useful for detection and surveillance of oral potentially malignant lesions and SCC of the oral cavity? Can NBI influence head and neck cancer management? And uh, that uh, was just touched on uh, briefly previously and we'll explore that in the context of um, oral cavity. Uh, can NBI assist with surgical margin delineation? We've done a lot of work in this space. Can NBI help with biomarker discovery and development. And this is where we've departed from the greater majority of what everyone else is looking at. And uh, we've spent a whole heap of time and a whole heap of money uh, trying to provide some uh, sound uh, scientific evidence for why NBI works and how it works. And finally, ultimately, uh, can NBI improve patient outcomes? So can it decrease local recurrence and increase patient survival? Because otherwise, why are we doing this? So there's a lot of questions to, um, to answer. And um, these are the uh, bits of work that we've been doing over the last, I don't know how many years, I lost track, but probably getting on close to 10 now. Um, in the different contexts of studies that I'll show you. So I'm going to throw a lot of uh, studies and papers at you. Uh, and hopefully try to convince you um, or those that need a little bit more convincing because there are many colleagues out there that uh, uh, need convincing um, scientifically why this technology works. <clears throat> so the first one, very simple concept, can NBI help detect a lesion? So the first uh, um, question that I always put to my colleagues is uh, can you see everything? Can you visualize everything? And of course we can't, we know that for a fact and we understand more and more about different technologies that allow us to visualize uh, and uh, if we accept that then we'll accept that we don't see everything under white light. That's a very simple fact. So can you see a lesion here for example? I won't um, ask each of you individually, it's not a test. Um, with, uh, and that's of course white light. This is with NBI, can you see the lesion? Well going back to Professor Peretti's talk, I can see the brown spots, great. So uh, I've got something I need to look at. What it is, we're going to explore in a little bit more detail, whether it's cancerous, precancerous, inflammatory, reactive, what have you. But at least I can see something a little bit better. I can see the brown spots that's supposed to attract my attention. And of course there is a lesion here, and I've marked it out for you where all these brown spots are. And the simple answer, um, from a couple of cases I can show you is, yes, we can detect a lesion better, but there's nothing better than actually doing a study to prove that, because we need evidence, we need to build that evidence to convince our colleagues, 
uh, sometimes to convince ourselves. Um, so here's a study from uh, our group, high specificity of combined narrowband imaging and autofluorescence, mucosal assessment of patients with head and neck. Uh, later on in the day, uh, you'll um, hear from Fan Nguyen, the first author of this paper. Um, he was a PhD student of mine uh, when he was in Brisbane with David Fielding. Um, and uh, he, he will talk to you about um, respiratory aspects of uh, narrowband uh, later on. So this was part of his PhD, and we we're essentially looking at both NBI and um, autofluorescence in the context of assessment of mucosal lesions. There is a, 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 um, a respiratory component to this study, but I won't steal his thunder. I'll just concentrate on the mucosal aspect. So when we're talking about can I see things, we really need to talk about sensitivity and specificity. So in the context of this study, um, which had uh, um, from memory a couple of hundred uh, patients, um, and then focusing specifically on uh, these head and neck uh, cases uh, only in the context of this slide, um, if you look at the white light assessment of these uh, cases and look at the sensitivity <laughs> and the specificity, the specificity was quite good, but the sensitivity was actually quite poor, 37%. If you assess the same lesions with fluorescence, and this was uh, um, the, one of the purposes of this study, you'll see that the sensitivity is actually quite good, but as we know with autofluorescence, the specificity is quite poor. And it doesn't matter what device of autofluorescence you use, whether it's handheld like we use in dentistry, or if it's a stack, um, basically we have this problem with false positives and with um, specificity that's quite low. But with MBI we have um, excellent sensitivity and I'd say very good specificity. It's not excellent, probably anything above 80 should be considered excellent. Um, but we have very good sensitivity and specificity in the context of detecting these lesions. So. In the context of this question, can NBI help us to detect lesion? Well, if we have sensitivity and specificity that is very high, then I think we can answer that question with a yes, it does do that. And of course, you can um, read the full extent of the uh, study. We don't have enough time to go through all the details. There's a lot of ground to cover. So assuming that we agree with that, and yes, we can actually detect the lesion, let's move on to the next question. And I've already foreshadowed that question with the previous slide. Uh, is NBI better than fluorescence? Well, we've already seen that the sensitivity and specificity is improved when we uh, use NBI compared to fluorescence. And part of that study was basically to uh, do that comparison. But also, um, in another study, this is a separate study, um, looking at combining autofluorescence and NBI with image analysis, so trying to understand it from the context of the little brown dots, but also the RGB of uh, image analysis. Uh, could we understand that a little bit more? And this is in the context of evaluation of pre-neoplastic lesions of the bronchus and larynx. And then again, you'll see Fan there as the first author. That was part of his PhD. So I won't bore you with all these details, but basically we tried to analyze these uh, changes um, uh, using RGB um, assessments. And here we're looking at a white light uh, image and also a fluorescence image um, of the right cord. You can see some changes with fluorescence. With MBI, however, you see more detailed changes. And again, we can go back to the um, uh, brown dots, and if we only use the brown dots as a, as a marker of where we should be looking at, then uh, we, we have a better assessment in the context of NBI compared to uh, the fluorescence, and this case was diagnosed as carcinoma in situ. <clears throat> we can take the assessments of these brown dots and we can compare that to the uh, profile, the uh, visual profile, uh, or the optical profile of the normal surrounding tissues and basically do assessments in the context of pixelation of um, either normal tissue compared to in this case that uh, one we just showed, the carcinoma in situ. So this is basically designed really as a concept to take us away from just looking at brown dots and to put some numerical data associated with those. So could we convert the image into a readout so we could basically point this device at something. Yes, uh, the learned clinician would say there are brown dots. Let me do A, B, and C with it. But 
can we basically connect it, for example, to a computer screen and it comes up with this algorithm that basically compares the um, uh, uh, pixels and the, the color values of, um, of the lesion. And basically we want to see that there's a significant difference between this area, which is the abnormal pathology, versus the normal uh, spectrum that we see uh, with normal light. And in essence, yes, we can do that. So it requires um, written algorithms, it requires a little bit of engineering, but that's one of the concepts of trying to take uh, NBI from um, uh, apl application in the clinic and the reliance, strictly speaking, just on the pattern, and we'll come back to patterns in a tick, uh, but also then to uh, try to uh, translate that into a value of some sort. So it's easier then to say, well, yes, if the threshold is there and the value is above this, then I've got a cancer versus if it's below that, maybe it's inflammation. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do with that analysis. So coming back to uh, this um, uh, study, again asking the same sort of question, is NBI better than uh, fluorescence? Uh, we'll highlight some examples. So I've already showed you the sensitivity and specificity in the context of those cases. Um, but here we have um, the white light um, uh, image, here we have the fluorescent image, and you can see there is no loss of fluorescence on this, um, on this image. And this is the image that I showed you earlier. Um, you already know that there are brown dots here. You already know there is a lesion here. And um, yes, with MBI, uh, we have um, the carcinoma in, in situ. So um, this is just a visual representation of the enhanced sensitivity and specificity that I highlighted to you earlier. I use a lot of fluorescence in other applications in the context of um, uh, oral potentially malignant pathology and fluorescence has its uh, place and I, I'm heavily dependent on that in the context of um, uh, oral potentially malignant lesions. Um, but because of the uh, deficiency in its specificity for um, cancerous lesions or at least moderate dysplasia and above, uh, without a doubt NBI um, um, outstrips or outdoes uh, fluorescence. So we'll come back also to that uh, idea. So we know it can detect lesions. We know it's better than fluorescence because the sensitivity and specificity is better. Um, but can NBI outline the extent, or what I call the true extent, of the lesion? Because we all see things, but we see things differently. And perhaps that may be uh, part of the differentiator between one clinician and another, or one surgeon and another. Um, and of course, if we see things, we can act on them, we can treat them. And if we don't see things, then we're basically working in the dark. So there is a lesion there, and I'm hoping that all of you can see that lesion, but oh, here it is, I've marked it out for you. So there is a lesion under, under white light, okay? But is that the full extent of the lesion? Obviously not. This is not the full extent of the lesion. Here's the NBI analysis of that lesion. And here's the extent of that lesion. You can see that the lesion extends far beyond what is seen um, uh, with white light. So here's the direct comparison. The lesion is at least double the size, if not triple the size of that noted under white light. So of course that takes you to the natural conclusion of, well, okay, if I can see it better, that's good. I can see the extent of it, that's even better but that may actually determine what I do as far as treatment. So if I was to resect this, for example, if I was to resect this case, and I'll talk a lot about resection in a little while, it would be a different surgical procedure than resecting this case. So could this possibly explain why we get very high recurrence rates? Because we think we're cutting things out, but it turns out that we're not cutting everything out. So if you were to cut this out under white light, there is no way that you would have predicted that was the extent of the lesion and you would not extend your surgical margins beyond where whatever assumption you use, half a centimetre, a centimetre, or even a centimetre and a half, because I've been told that some people like to use centimetre and a half margins. Um, I don't think that would have captured the, the full extent of that lesion. So here we've got an SCC in the floor of mouth that basically extends way beyond the extent of the white light. Of course, this is a case, so we don't want to do things in the context of just cases. We want to um, uh, assess them in the context of uh, well-structured studies. 
So I'm going to come back and revisit margins um, in, in great detail. So the next question is, can NBI detect oral potential in malignant lesions? And the reason why we raise this is, one, this is a particular area of interest for me because I look at potential malignant lesions every day in my clinic. But two, if you understand the basic mechanism of the operation of MBI, it requires angiogenesis. So yes, with early cancers, we understand that the greater majority, if not all of them, have new blood vessel formation, and that drives tumor genesis because it's a feeding beast that needs nutrients. But early changes, mild dysplasia, for example, possible moderate dysplasia, those changes don't necessarily require angiogenesis angiogenesis. So you'll get epithelial changes, limited just to the epithelium, but you may not get any vascular changes beneath that. So we asked the question, well, okay, understanding how NBI works, can we still see whether this technology is useful to detect oral potential in malignant lesions? And these are typically always limited to epithelium. Um, so this is a study from our group, uh, 200 and 72 lesions from 95 different patients that we were uh, assessing, basically assessing their sensitivity, specificity, the positive and negative predictive value and the accuracy of uh, NBI. And what we were trying to demonstrate is basically a comparison between what we term conventional oral exam, uh, what we would normally do every day, uh, versus the white light feature of the endoscope. So this is just um, normal white light source. This is the endoscope of the stack, and this is the green, blue, NBI light of um, the stack. And basically undertaking comparisons, so using different gold standards. So for the conventional oral exam, the gold standard would be um, uh, assessed in the context of the white light, but also then comparing that with NBI. If we were assessing the NBI, of course, the conventional oral exam may be seen as the, uh, the base to compare to or alternatively just the white light endoscopy. So in this particular study, we were using white light headlights with two and a half times magnification. Now that is not seen necessarily to be 100% conventional oral exam because many people don't use loops, don't use magnification, and many people still don't use white light. Well, at least for assessment of oral potential and malignant lesions. Um, so we're already starting from a very low base. Um, but you can see that uh, in the context of this assessment of conventional oral exam, white light with loops, the NBI actually did very well, so uh, there was really no difference. Specificity was a little bit low in that context. Um, positive predictive value, negative predictive value were very good, and the accuracy was excellent. There's really not much in the accuracy overall when you're looking at NBI, white light feature alone, or this conventional oral exam, head, white light, head light with magnification, in the context of detecting oral potentially malignant lesions. And the reason being is because you're looking at surface changes. You're not looking at really noticing a, a whole heap of vascular changes underneath. So this is a set of examples from this study um, where we have different um, oral potential malignant lesions, you know, maybe a leukoplakia or a traumatic keratosis, a white patch, an ulcer, a mixed red-white erythroleukoplakia, and again, a mixed red-white erythroleukoplakia. So these are all oral potential malignant lesions. And as we track here, these are the white light images. The next stack is basically the NBI images. Uh, the next stack typically is a, um, a magnified or a high power image of the NBI and um, sometimes again um, magnified a little bit further for um, accuracy. So when people talk about the uh, typing of these lesions, um, there are different type uh, um, IPCL typings in the context of different anatomy. So whether you're looking at larynx, whether you're looking at oral cavity. Um, so we traditionally use Takano's um, uh, classification. But when we used Takano's cl classification in this study, we found that we ran into a problem with thick leukoplakic keratotic lesions. And uh, in, in truth, you cannot see through thick leukoplakic 
keratotic lesions to assess underlying IPCL. You can't see the brown dots essentially because there's so much thick material on top. Um, so we came up with this new type that we call type 0. And basically it's a type 0 that you cannot see IPCL through the thick area and you're very much limited to going around the margin and assessing the margin of where the leukoplakia extends to and you may be able to make a call about um, IPCL patterns around the margin but it's not as accurate as basically looking at the lesion itself through the tissue. So we've coined this type 0. Um, I haven't seen any other papers that basically have adopted type 0 yet but I'm not sure if people are, are really looking at these things and saying I really can't see anything underneath. So I'm not sure how they're assessing the IPCL. I sincerely believe that type 0 should be introduced. Of course we have the normal patterns. We have type 1, okay, so the normal running of the um, uh, uh, blood vessel, whether it's running um, uh, parallel to the uh, tissue itself. Of course the different parts of the anatomy, even within the oral cavity, will have different um, um, IPCL patterns, but also different normal vascular uh, appearance and Professor Peretti uh, explained those in the context of, uh, of larynx. So we have these waved uh, parallel running um, type 1 um, uh, pattern. Here we have a type 2 uh, pattern. This is a common um, oral potentially malignant lesion that we see, um, oral lichen planus. You have a central um, area of ulceration. You can see you've lost your epithelial um, covering and we're starting to see type 2 patterns and typically in the context of oral cavity at least type 2 patterns are indicative of inflammatory pathology. And here we have a type 3 pattern so this is a non-homogeneous leukoplakia that I just showed the white light image on the lateral tongue and now you can start to see the the brown dots so to speak um, and in the context of type 3 pattern it's not as um, spotted strictly speaking as a type 4 uh, but here we're starting to think we have dysplasia. We have dysplastic tissue change occurring in this tissue and of course we need to prove that. But that'll, be, that'll be the next study. But this is a type 3 um, oral pattern. And of course then the type 4 uh, pattern where you're getting significant disruption, widening, the uh, vessels become uh, thick and tortuous. Um, the pattern is also very important to note that it's not just about the brown spotted dots because it depends on how the blood vessels are actually oriented, whether they're oriented perpendicular or oriented parallel to the surface tissue, as Professor Peretti explained. So this is a type 4 pattern, but if you're only chasing brown dots that are basically pointing at you, you will dismiss this uh, presentation. So it's a little bit more subtle than just looking at uh, the brown dots, and this is um, uh, a um, SCC. So here we have the uh, mixed red white uh, erythroleukoplakia that I just showed uh, earlier and this is the pattern. You can see significant uh, areas of interest that are really subtle to most but uh, in the context of oral potentially malignant lesions these are the sorts of things we're changing. So we're really much interested in early detection of these lesions and here we are. These are our brown dots so to speak. Okay? And here's another mixed red white patch uh, erythroleukoplakia. Uh, buccal mucosa and that's the pattern of the uh, type 4 that I just highlighted to you with the SCC. So um, yes we can actually detect oral potentially malignant lesions. We can actually do it quite well but it does require a little bit of subtlety in the context of that thick keratotic leukoplakia. Assessment of uh, underlying blood vessels is not always possible and we need to bear that in mind. So we believe that's an easy question to answer. This question is much more difficult to answer. Can NBI aid the detection of dysplasia? So here we're asking a visual tool to answer a microscopic question. Now we don't have microscopes in our eyes, otherwise we could just do those things immediately. We wouldn't need to do resections and send to the pathologist. Um, but in the concept of optical biopsy, that's the underlying real strength of trying to use uh, these devices. So we're taking this from a clinical tool and asking it to do something much more powerful, which is basically tell us about the microscopic um, 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 changes or the cellular changes in this case with dysplasia. 
So that's the question we asked. Uh, this is a, a separate study that we looked at a whole myriad of um, lesions and then a subset of them, so 93 of them were actually biopsied. So we could assess the correlation between the clinical features but also the histopathological features. And you can see here that when we're using a normal white light source, the sensitivity for detection of dysplasia, sorry. So remember we're asking clinically to detect dysplasia, which is really uh, impossible. Uh, but we're saying, what's the ability of us to predict that using IPCL pattern, knowing that we have the full histopathological diagnosis later on? The sensitivity um, is reasonably poor. The specificity, not too bad. The accuracy, acceptable. But there's no difference between whether you're using white light or using NBI. So part of that is related to the IPCL pattern itself. How well do we know that type 2 is really related to inflammatory conditions and type 3 is related to dysplastic conditions? We don't really know that that well. So that's part of the problem. The other part of the problem is subjectivity. We're all looking at brown dots, but we assess them differently. So the classifications that we're using, although good, they're not excellent. We're still assessing brown dots. So Maybe you would assess one of the lesions as type 3 and I would assess it as type 2 and that will change the diagnosis. Indeed, that's what we did in that study. I had one of my graduate students do all of the assessments and then I did all of the other assessments. We didn't agree. So we didn't agree and then we had to sit down and actually go through the cases and look at Takano's classification again and have consensus and this is the result of consensus but still after consensus, not very good. So what we're trying to do currently is assess this in a, in a, um, a group of um, dysplastic lesions that we've biopsied over time because we've built hundreds of these now and we can go back retrospectively and make assessments about them. So we still need to do better to be able to understand what's going on in the context of dysplasia. So the answer to that question is not yet. We can't do that accurately for um, detecting dysplasia yet, but we can detect um, OPMDs pretty well. So the next question is, well, okay, we can detect OPMDs or oral potential lesions. We know we can detect o OSCCs. Can we continuously monitor those patients over time? And so this is the graduate student, Anne Vu. Uh, she did uh, fantastic work, and this was part of her thesis. And so she carried out a systematic review um, on this topic. And at the time, there weren't that many studies that we could actually assess in the context of a systematic review. And we both assessed these, and we basically tried to come up from the literature with assessments around sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy for surveillance. So detection and surveillance, sorry. Okay. So you can see that there was a range, low to high, low to high, very low to high. So there was a significant uh, bit of discrepancy between the studies, and I think as we have more and more studies come into the literature, that should improve. Okay, but for NBI, it was actually pretty good. So high sensitivity, specificity, positive and negative predictive value, and accuracy. So it is a useful tool to continuously be able to monitor your patients whether you do surgery or not on those patients. In some cases, of course, we don't want to do surgery. So it is good for um, surveillance. Okay, so the next question, can NBI influence our head and neck um, cancer management? And Professor Peretti also highlighted in his talk that it does make a significant difference in changing what you do. And I think it was 35 of those cases you mentioned in your study. Um, and the um, largest differential is in larynx. Um, we haven't been able to document the extent of the difference in the context of oral cavity because we don't have that many numbers like you do. Um, but in this particular study, that was one of the questions that we asked. Will this use of NBI actually change the way we manage our patients? Okay. So that was one of the things that we were trying to do. And in this case, we only had 73 um, uh, patients to, to look at. So this is the Takano classification that we used. But for this particular study, we were interested in these narrowband imaging features. So 
for the uh, grade three, or what we considered it a grade three, it had to have more than or equal to two criteria present. So it had to have the brown spots, the capillary loops, dotted vessels, and that's what we had to actually prove that we had um, before we could classify uh, these patients and then see what we would do as far as altered treatment. Uh, the table here is not designed to actually be read. The table here is designed to show you that there's a whole myriad of patients that actually had their treatment management changed or altered because of the NBI. Okay, So I'm going to highlight one of those to you. So as you can see they're all numbered, patient one, patient two, patient three, and as we go and I'm going to show you some of those as examples. So here's patient four from that table that we just showed. This is the fluorescent pattern, Okay, this is the NBI features, this is for that particular patient. Anterior commissia was not detected at initial white light endoscopy. Okay, Very diffuse subtle changes in the context of fluorescence, but you can see just looking at IPCL pattern with the brown dots, there's a significant lesion there um, that was basically influencing then ultimately what the surgeons did for this patient. This is another patient, so patient two from that table. So again, very subtle changes in the context of autofluorescence and the spotted lesions in the context of NBI, um, high grade dysplasia on follow up. So we know for a fact that it will change management. And obviously if it's changing management, then hopefully it's changing the patient's outcomes. Okay? So from that um, expression, we thought to ourselves, well, okay, it changes what we do for the patient. Um, can it change the way we actually manage the patient? So it's forcing us to go down a particular path, um, but how do we use that prospectively in the context of uh, definitive uh, assessment? So we designed this study as a subset of the other study and basically looking specifically at margin definition, so coming back to the extent of the lesion, and margin definition of a subset of 20 patients from those 73 that we had in the initial um, study. And you can see uh, Fan's name there again. Um, and what we wanted to do with this is not just to show that clinically or histopathologically, because we obviously had the pathologist on board, um, the pathologist, so the pathologist was blind and did not know anything about the assessments we were doing. But we wanted to do this at a molecular level. And part of the reason, to be totally honest, in doing that uh, is twofold. Uh, one, to better understand what we were looking at. So was NBI magic? How did it work? Could we understand that at a microscopic cellular and molecular level? Um, or is it just, you know, smoke and mirrors? And the other part was really, can we create evidence to basically support the clinical findings, the visual findings, so people could feel a little bit more comfortable that there was logic and science and biological evidence for, for this assessment. And of course, the um, ultimate underlying premise in the context of my group is um, precision medicine. That's something that I'm particularly interested in, and my group does a lot of work on biomarkers, which I'll show you in a little while. So here we have um, a, a lesion in the context of uh, an oral cavity, SCC, that's the lesion, that's the um, uh, extent of the surgery you might want to take if you want to leave some pathology behind. Um, this is the uh, other extreme, you might extend your margin significantly and make sure that you've got every bit of diseased tissue. Um, of course that comes with a cost to the patient. Um, and of course you might strike a happy medium. You might strike a happy medium where you take out just what you need to take out and nothing more. So this is what we talk about in the context of the ethical resection. But how do we know where to cut and where to stop? And that's really the, the ultimate question. Of course in the context that we have in the middle, we have different surgeons using dif different algorithms, whether it's based on personal preference or it's based on the literature. I'll extend my lesion to half a centimeter. And I always do that and therefore uh, that will be my formula. So that's an algorithm or I'll extend it to a centimeter or I'll be guided by the tissue plane and I'll just play it by ear. But some surgeons have said to me categorically, well, I always resect to 1.5 centimeters beyond the extent of the lesion. Now they say that to me and as I said from the beginning, I'm not a head and neck surgeon, but they say that to me to say, 
I would have always caught the margin of that lesion, okay, because my margin is so wide. What I'm trying to actually instill is basically to say you only cut what you need and you make sure that your margin is clear. So don't just rely on an algorithm. Why don't you rely on something that is actually visualized in front of you for that particular patient? So it's personalized because I don't think we actually personalize our treatments in this regard. So this is like, you know, a little bit too small, a little bit too big, just right. I came to have my porridge, was it a little bit too hot, was it a little bit too cold, but I want it just right. I want my porridge just right. So this is what we're aiming for. Okay, so in the context of that, we know as surgeons we've got problems. Okay, we know that we have high recurrence rates. This is what the literature says in the context of local um, recurrence, up to 20% um, recurrence. And of course, there's an assumption here that um, uh, the recurrences come from involved margins, but even non-involved margins have recurrences. So part of the idea is to say, well, if we didn't see the lesion properly the first instance, then obviously we possibly are resecting and leaving minimal residual disease behind. And that may be a, a reason why we have um, high recurrences. So the top image here is uh, from our study. We basically used the white light, the, the um, NBI, and this is the ultimate resection layer where we've overlaid exactly where we're we've cut from and basically where we've sampled from. And these are images from our European Italian colleagues where basically they've marked up in a very similar way what that's the lesion, that's the white light margin that they would have gone to and the blue is the NBI margin they would have gone to or they did go to. And the importance of the, this figure and this cartoon here is to show that NBI doesn't give you a formula NBI guides where you go. So if you believe it and you trust it, you must go there. You can't just say, oh yes, that's where it said I should go, but I'm resistant, I don't. I, I really want to just do my own thing. So you have to just let go. As a surgeon, I think that's very, very difficult. But if you do resect to the NBI margins, as I'll show you in a tick, you have fantastic outcomes. So that's the first point of this cartoon. The second point is that the, the margins are never symmetrical. They're not designed to be symmetrical. So in some instance where you'll see the margin extends where you need to extend it because that's where the lesion takes you. The lesion takes you there. The NBI is just guiding you. So you have to go there. So it's not always symmetrical. So that's the counter argument to some surgical colleagues who say, here's my tumor in blue. I'm going to go one and a half centimeter all the way around. I've got it. Trust me, I've got it. And I'll say, sorry, but you don't. Okay, you don't because the lesion doesn't grow symmetrically. It just doesn't grow perfectly in every dimension. So we need to understand that this, is, this beast doesn't behave in ways that basically are logical. So that's the concept behind these. And it's very important that you be guided by what the NBI uh, shows you. So that's what we did in a group of 20 patients. We said to the surgeon, uh, would you be guided by our assessment of MBI? So we assess the lesion, we assess the white light margin, we assess the narrowband imaging margin. We basically told the surgeon where to cut to and the surgeon was fantastic and they cut exactly to that area. So that's, that's a lot of trust if you really believe it, that the surgeon just giving that power away just to rely on this device. So this is a study we did um, when I was in Brisbane and basically what we're trying to show here are the molecular margins and I'll explain this very very briefly. So we did the lesion itself, okay, I'll just go back, the lesion itself, okay, we took a sample from there, where the surgeon drew the white light margin, took a sample from there and where we told the surgeon to resect to and that's the NBI margin, we took a sample from there. So little four or five millimeter punch biopsies from each of those margins. And then we did molecular analysis on them. So we did gene expression in this particular instance. So what you'll see here is that these NBI margins are coded in blue, the white light margins are coded in green, and the tumors, the center of the tumor is coded in red. And this is a hierarchical cluster. So it's basically a, a way of grouping things together to see like or not like. 
Another way of uh, explaining this is if you took these 60 odd samples, because there's three from every patient, there's 20, and you put them in your hand and actually threw them up in the air, and you just waited until they basically landed on the floor, and you would see that they would group in particular ways. So this is basically that clustering. How did they group together? How did they bunch together? And of course the concept is that the premise is that the tumors will all cluster together and the NBI margins will all cluster together because they're supposed to be different. And if we believe that NBI is giving us a better margin, then, then it should be the case. We always assume that the white light margin will probably be closer to the NBI margin from a molecular sense. So how many disrupted genes would there be between those two? And when we clustered these, these four cases, patients 7, 10, 1 and 11, their lesions, their white light margin, clustered with the tumour, not with the NBI. So what does that really mean? That means that if the surgeon would have cut that tumour out to the white light margin, they would have left disease tissue behind, which is molecularly exactly the same as the um, tumour tissue itself. Okay? versus all these other patients that basically clustered on the other side. So their white light margin was basically molecularly very similar to the NBI margin. But most importantly, not a single NBI margin clustered with the tumor. Okay, so on a spectrum, you'll see that the tumor is the most aberrant molecularly, the white light margin is a little bit less, and the NBI margin is a little bit less. Now I just want to remind you, you might think, well Camille, that makes sense because you're going on a spectrum going further out from the tumour. You're not always going out further from the tumour in a symmetrical um, uh, straight line. Okay? So it just depends on where we sampled that particular uh, lesion. And, and we only had one sample. So you could say, well that's a deficiency of your study. You're only telling me about that margin. What about the other margin there or there? Okay? And I'll say, yes, I only had money enough to do that particular one. When we were doing this, it was costing us about $2,000 to do one sample to sequence them. So you can imagine there's a lot of money going into this. But what we did show is that four out of these 18 patients that we had in um, the uh, assessment all the way, we started with 20 and we lost two along the way, 22% clustered with the tumour. So we could argue that those are potentially the 20 odd percent that recur from the literature. Of course, we can't prove that, but we could argue that. Okay? But that implies that 22% of these surgical procedures benefited from using the NBI. So similar to Professor Peretti, where he's talking about 20-odd, 20 20-25-odd 20, in the context of larynx improvement, we're basically saying the same thing. It's around 20-25% to 25 improvement in your outcomes if you use NBI versus using normal white light. That's a big deal. That's an absolute big deal. Okay? And I'm going to come back to this one in a tick because we have followed these patients for a minimum of five years. So can NBI assist in surgical margin delineation? Absolutely. Absolutely it can. Okay? So of course we're uh, interested as another track of our um, group is basically coming up with biomarkers for head and neck cancers. So if you believe that NBI is giving you a true normal whatever that is, um, then you can use that tissue to basically do comparative studies for gene expression. And that's what we've done in this particular study. I won't bore you with all the details. But here we basically did the um, uh, RNA expression on these and here we've got the NBI in blue, the white light margins in green and the tumors in red. And again, that similar, similar sort of exercise, you just throw them up in the air. And this is basically a principal component analysis that shows you how they cluster. Just another way of doing it. And you can see the NBI margins always clustered to the right. The tumors always clustered to the left. And the white light margins are clustered in between. So spatially, as far as the tumor is concerned, that's exactly what you have in the patient. But we want to prove that molecularly. This proves it molecularly. This is objective data. It's not my opinion. It's not the surgeon's opinion. This is just what the molecular data punched out. It could have been completely wrong and these could have been over here and we would have gone back to the drawing board. But this gave us a whole heap of confidence to say we're on the right track. We've done the same thing with microRNAs and these are different uh, molecules. They influence what happens in the context of mRNA and the same pattern. Again, NBI clusters to the right, tumor clusters to the left and a whole myriad of, uh, sorry, a whole myriad of white light samples in between. 
You see that they're not um, um, exactly all uh, the, the same in the context of number, so we have fewer NBI margins. That's because when we process the sample molecularly, sometimes you don't pass quality assurance, so you unfortunately lose the sample along the way. And this is the ultimate outcome in the context of saying, can we come up with a diagnostic biomarker set to distinguish an SCC from normal tissue? So we could basically say, can we distinguish an SCC from the normal margin? So this is another way of saying to the surgeon, you've got your whole tumour out. You just relax. It's, it's done. It's 100%. And we were able to come up with a panel of 23 mRNAs that could segregate these with 100% accuracy. So there's 23 genes that we have to do assessments on, but if we did them for every single resection, we could tell the surgeon, you've got the whole sample out, that's fine. So it's the molecular equivalent to your frozen section. Of course, it takes more time. So this is what we're working on. We're trying to refine this, and we have come down from 23. Okay? But NBI is that technology that allowed us to push that idea of normal tissue as a, a, at a resection margin. So yes, it can help us discover um, biomarkers. These are actually the biomarkers, but uh, you can see that the names aren't there because we're trying to develop them for a molecular test with one of our molecular partners, Thermo Fisher. Um, but basically, these are the um, um, biomarkers. These are the patients. So these are the patients in, that have the tumor. These are the patients that have the um, um, NBI margin. And you can see that it segregates perfectly. They separate perfectly. There's literally a line in between. And these markers, whatever they are, pretty much give us 100% accuracy. There's, I think, um, 18 or 20 of them. 100% accuracy to separate those margins. And that's what we're trying to build now, a little biomarker panel that you can take a little sample from your margin and do a quick PCR and you prove straight away that your margin is clear. So we believe obviously it will be better than frozen, but we have to get there. So this is a comparison between the tumour and the white light. So you've got the white light samples and you've got the tumour samples. And again, we can create a different biomarker set that tells us that difference in pathology. So we presume that there's some dysplasia in those white light margins because when we report margins that are clear, we're talking about cancer clear. Most pathologists will still keep dysplasia and say it's clear. Personally, I don't believe that. Um, it should not have dysplasia in it. If it has dysplasia in it, it should not be clear. But that's a whole different argument, okay? So we, we believe that some of these carry dysplasia Okay, and those margins should never be called clear. They're not clear, they're dysplastic. Okay, and then the last comparison is looking at the NBI margin samples with the white light, and you can see here they're all mishmashed amongst each other. There's some separation, but it's not perfect. And this little graph up the top here basically just tells you what the accuracy. For the other two, it's 100%, okay? But for this, it's only about 80%. So what this says to you is, we can come up with a, a biomarker set that can separate the NBI from the white light, but they're so close, but we can still segregate them, but only to 80% accuracy. So we need a bit more work to, uh, to look at that. Okay, so let's take this to the next level. I showed you all of the mRNA um, uh, assessments, and this is our latest paper that literally was just published earlier this year. Um, and this is looking at the microRNA expression because these genes basically influence what mRNAs do. And mRNAs, of course, tell us about protein. And also we're looking at basically seeing, well, can we come up with a better biomarker set that is not just mRNA? And what I just showed you was just mRNA. So we're trying to perfect that. And we believe that the microRNA combination will help us to go down that path so we can limit the number of genes. So in this particular instance, uh, we've done gene expression on the microRNAs. And you can see all the different microRNAs. So we've put it out there in public so anyone can go and start to develop their own uh, kits if they want to. Of course, we have the upper hand because I know the really good ones. Uh, but you can see there's a whole myriad of gene expression at microRNA level, whether it be in a combination of the tumour to the white light margin or the tumour to the NBI margin. But you would expect to see that the tumour to NBI margin segregation is much larger, therefore there should be more genes, okay, compared to, say, 
uh, white light and NBI, or for that matter, tumor and white light. So here are all of these microRNAs that help us segregate things. And if you look at the uh, top three overexpressed and underexpressed, this is the top number one, microRNA21. So if you follow this literature, MER21 comes up in just about every head and neck cancer study. So that's good that it came up in this study because otherwise we'd be in trouble. So th this is really like a little confirmation to say, yes, you're on the right path again. Um, but again, you look at the NBI, it's got less expression of the MER21 compared to the cancer, which is what we would expect. And these are just some others that we put up, the, uh, the top three. And these are the bottom three as far as down-regulated genes. So there's a, a big difference between the tumor and the NBI. So this starts to give you some concept of, okay, I can go for the extremes. I can go for the most upregulated or the most downregulated. Of course, it's a bit more complicated than that. Uh, this is the figure that I showed you in the context of the um, microRNA. They do segregate. And this is the clustering of the microRNA. So this is not the same as the clustering of the mRNA. So we've done that all over again with these samples for microRNA. And as the tree, so this is the family tree, and all of those lesions start at the family tree, and then they segregate one branch and then another branch. And all of these sub-branches come from that one branch. And look at all of the samples, T, 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 W, W, T, 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 T. So you'll see some Ws between the Ts. Look at the top branch. You've got all of the MBIs and the white lights together. And it basically confirms that earlier study looking at microRNA. It's the same profile using different genes and different markers. These patients basically would have done worse had they not actually been assessed with um, NBI. Now you can see that they're not the same patient. That's number patient 18. Okay, that's patient 4. Patient 1 and 4, I think from memory, were on that one, patient 18 wasn't. So of course we have to go back and now try to merge them all together, and that's what we've tried to do. So you can look at the mRNA expression related to those microRNAs. So we've just shown the top three. So MMPs, we know that MMPs change. Everyone believes that. So when you show them that data and you go, okay, you're on the right path. Yes, apparently MMPs are overexpressed. So no one's going to argue with you. When you start talking about, you know, CRISP3, and everyone looks at you and says, what, what are you talking about? Okay. So, of course, all these novel genes that basically we need to go and explore. Whereas MMPs, everyone knows MMPs are upregulated in SCC. So we've taken the microRNA, we've taken the mRNA, and we've basically whopped them together. And this is basically what this is, a circus plot. Um, it's a circus, not a circus, but it looks like a circus, as in with a U. Uh, basically, it's one big mess. But you're, what you're looking at is basically all of the chromosomes with up and down regulated, and basically you're looking at um, a microRNA differential expression. Okay? And what we're trying to do is to see if the microRNAs that we had differentially expressed through MBI and the mRNAs that we had differentially expressed actually make sense. So biologically, do they communicate? Are they related? Okay? Because we know that microRNAs influence the activity of mRNA. But is it the right combination? Because it just may be random, and we don't think it's random. We think it's purposeful. Okay? So of course, they're up and down regulated and all of those things which I won't bore you with. And we can look at these relationships as what we call reciprocal relationships and non-reciprocal relationships. And of course, we believe that the uh, reciprocal relationships are more important and um, biologically uh, justified or sound. So what we're showing you here is basically all of the microRNAs on this end and all of the mRNAs, the genes on this end. And these are the relationships that they have. For example, MER145 is related to uh, some other MERS, but also related to um, uh, mRNAs. For example, it's, this one's related to MMP12. So what we're really showing here is, is there a combination of genes that work together and have biological relevance to what we're seeing clinically? Does it explain what we see clinically? And of course, there's a whole myriad of ways we can do that. We can do these functional analyses where we basically stick mRNAs and microRNAs in a plot and see what their relationships are. 
and we can see that they are interlinked and they have relationships. And you can do that and change the center or whatever the gene that you want to look at. You can put this one at the center and see what the relationships. So it's basically family trees. It's extended family trees and you want to know what that family is doing. So we do believe that our microRNA, mRNA, what we call the interactome because they interact, uh, provides insight into the dysregulated signaling of OSCC and supports the um, clinical features that we see on tumor margins. And it supports our premise that resection to NBI is better than resecting to white light if you follow the NBI. Don't have a formula, just follow the NBI. You'll be fine. We've, we've shown you molecularly we'll be fine. You'll be fine. Those patients will benefit. What we're really saying in a very roundabout way, and this is where um, the underlying premise is, that by looking at the tumor combination on all of those analysis, replace the T with SCC, replace the MBI just with normal tissue, because if we believe apparently it's normal, and replace the white light margin with dysplasia, we've essentially got a study of malig uh, malignant transformation from normal to dysplastic to SCC. So that really is the driving force behind us using this technology to then come up with a molecular panel. And that's what we're working with Thermo Fisher to help us to basically put a, a small little panel about 10, 12 genes together and we can use that in the clinic or the laboratory. Okay, so it does allow us to develop biomarkers. It'll probably be another five years before we can get that to uh, market, but we're onto it. But this is really the important bit. Does it make a difference to patients? All of these things are really interesting and academically um, exciting. Does it make a difference? And this one was literally just published, um, I think a couple of months ago, a couple of weeks ago, although it was accepted in, in August. And this is the five year follow up of those patients that we did, the 73 patients and then the 20 that had molecular margins. So it's a minimum of five years. As you'll see, some of them had seven year follow up data. Okay. So I believe this is our best study yet, because you're only as good as your last song, right? Yeah. So this is what we did with these patients. We had uh, 20 to start off with. We lost two along the way molecularly, because we didn't have good samples. We followed them for five years minimum, but some of them up to seven years. One declined follow-up. We lost that patient straight away. At the latest follow-up, which included up to seven years post-surgery, 14 of the 19 patients, or 73%, were still alive with no recurrence. We're measuring recurrence and disease-free survival. Two patients, or 10%, had died from metastatic disease, but with no recurrence. They did not have recurrence. One patient, 5.26%, or 5%, died from disease with local recurrence. One patient had local recurrence. And two patients, 10%, had died disease-free from other causes, not related to their cancer. In total, out of the 19 patients that we still had for follow-up because we lost one, 16 of them, or 84%, you might be generous enough to round it up to 85, but 84% were followed for a minimum of five years because some were followed up to seven. Uh, a minimum of five years that were followed, they were still alive, had not developed local recurrence. Okay, so. Here we have disease-free survival at 85%. These are across the board T1 to T4. We didn't make a distinction between T stage. So across the board, all bunched in together, T1 to T4. And only one patient developed local recurrence. Disease-free survival, five years, was 84%, and local recurrence rate was only 5%. In the literature, categorically, just about every study, the recurrence rate is 20%. So, I believe this is the first study that shows that NBI will decrease significantly recurrence at five years for oral cavity cancers. I can't talk about any of the other cancers because I haven't done the study, but only for oral cavity cancers, okay? And a five-year survival of 85 across T1 to T4 mixed together is pretty damn good because we still talk about 50% five-year survival rates across the board. And we know that T4s are much worse. We know that T1s are nearly 85, 90, sometimes even better, 95%. But this is across the board, no distinction made, okay? So of course we believe that if you resect to NBI, you will have better survival outcomes, you have less recurrence. We've just proven that you have 
um, more distinct molecular cleaner margins. I think that's pro probably as much evidence as someone needs if they're a skeptic. Okay? But it turns out that's not enough. Okay? So this is how we assessed all of our cases. So this is the one example where we, this is the resection. This is where we took our sample, 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 and did a three-way co comparison molecularly. We um, uh, drew them up so we could actually see them in a spatial sense, and we did that for every single one. Um, this is just the top five patients, but you can see the data that we collected talks about whether they're, you know, perineural invasion or not, what the T stage was. You can see they're, they're a mix. These are just the top five, and you've got T1s and T4s. Where they were, they were all oral cavity and a, a different sort of uh, mix of uh, well, moderately, or poorly differentiated. They were all HPV po uh, negative, so anyone's going to ask me about, we assess that. They're all HPV negative. They're true oral cancers, okay? And yes, they did have... Um, chemo or radiotherapy later on, some did, some didn't, so we assessed all of that. Uh, they had neck dissections, and of course we know what their final outcome is, and that's how we did the analysis. And you can see, sorry, the, uh, the uh, uh, latest follow-up. So, um, you know, this patient obviously died, we can't follow a patient who's dead. Uh, that's why the 2.9, but all of the ones that were alive five years or uh, at minimum, some for, for much more. So uh, these patients benefited significantly. Um, after the surgery, only five needed um, or did have radiotherapy based on their stage. Uh, five all, sorry, four also received chemotherapy. Um, of course, we believe that the initial definitive surgery is uh, the guiding principle. Um, we did have the pathologist look at the margins. This is how we assessed the margins. So we had one close, for example, at one millimeter. Um, and the tumor histology predominantly was moderate and then some well, um, two poorly and one uh, verrucous carcinoma. So this is the most important bit. One patient only or 5% had local recurrence and that's what we're trying to, to, to assess. Can we do better? Can we improve um, all of those outcomes? And 84% um, survival, five-year survival. So. To the best of our knowledge, this study is the first to show that if you resect with NBI for oral cavity cancers at five years, you'll do much better. Obviously, it is not a paired study. We don't have a control group. We only have these 20 patients who received NBI resection and the surgeon basically went with that resection. So we don't have a comparison. So of course, whenever you get to one study, everyone says that's not enough. I need you to show me more. So, of course, when we published, uh, and I presented previously, and Professor Peretti saw me talk up at the larynx uh, meeting in Cairns, everyone's going, oh, yeah, that's really good data and all of this sort of stuff, but you don't have an RCT. So we're not going to believe you unless you have an RCT, basically. I said, okay, fine. So here we are, uh, and we've got an RCT later. I don't know how many years later. Uh, there is an RCT. We've got a registered RCT in Perth. It's registered. There's the number. We're recruiting. I think we've recruited 10 patients already. So um, this has been going on for about a year now. If you've ever done an RCT, you'll understand how difficult it is. Um, so this is a local RCT that we've got running in Perth, and we're trying to get funding to basically extend that um, across the country. So um, in closing, NBI in practice. Um, this is the paper that we've summarized these things, similar to um, how many cases do you need to do before you become confident that you can see the dots? You know, a couple of hundred, really. And this is something that we've explored in this mini review, basically, where we talk about our experiences, if you're interested. But in summary, we believe that the, well, I believe, I believe that the highest standard of care for detection, management, and monitoring of oral potentially malignant lesions comes through the use of MBI. That's what I've got in my practice. I'm privileged to have this. I use it on definitely all high-risk patients. Um, I don't use it on every patient. I'll be categorical about that. Um, one, because it does take time. Two, because I use fluorescence a lot for that. And three, it comes at a cost. So in a private practice setting, you have to be mindful of that. So in the context of the data, the data tells me that anything from mild dysplasia and less probably not going to pick it up as much. But what I do use it for is the beautiful big screen that I can see surface changes and I can make assessments about homogenous versus non-homogenous and change the subtlety of how I go about looking at my patients. So that's a whole different um, field. 
And of course, in the context of uh, management, the highest standard of care, um, I believe, from our, from our literature, and I know there's a whole heap of literature out there, Professor Peretti, Professor Piazza, many other people, the Japanese groups, the Spanish groups, but I'm just basing it on my experience, resection of oral cancer, reduction of recurrence, and improved long-term um, outcomes and, su and surveillance for patients um, is achieved through uh, use of MBI on a regular basis. If you're interested, um, we explore these concepts. Uh, this is a collective group of like-minded people, um, but we come from different parts of the world. This was a meeting that we had in, um, in Perth uh, a couple of years ago, where we have engineers and uh, computer programmers and pathologists and surgeons. We all got together. We're all interested in optical imaging. And we produced this paper as a distillation of our thought process around this. And uh, my bit explores NBI in the context of um, optical imaging. And we talk about why adoption rates are very low. Why are surgeons, for example, resistant to do that? Or in some parts of the world, they're more resistant to do, as Professor Peretti knows. Um, and yet you build the evidence and you go, well, how come we're not actually getting more people to actually take it up? And there's a whole myriad of reasons. It's not just based on science. Um, there, was a, there was an article in the um, Australian on Wednesday that explored the concept of scientists trying to influence policy makers, as in government bureaucrats. Scientists talk one language. Government bureaucrats talk a completely different language. And part of it is what are we losing in translation to get some of these things adopted into clinical practice, uh, into translation. So anyway, this explores that if you're interested and a whole myriad of other interesting concepts of molecular assessment margins. So in closing, I have to thank a whole myriad of people. Uh, these are the great people that I get to work with. I've got collaborations all across the country. Um, we're extending that um, bit of work uh, wherever we can. A uh, group of people in my lab, uh, all of our funding bodies, uh, we're privileged to be funded by a whole myriad of people. Mo most recently, we've got another grant last year from the NHMRC. Um, and of course, all of the patients, they let us actually assess them and take biopsies from them. And they're very generous in, um, in helping us do research. Uh, I haven't had a patient touch wood yet who's rejected or denied um, being involved in, um, in a study or a, a collection of a sample. So I, I'm very, very privileged. Um, and then thank you uh, once again for your uh, attention. Thank you.